Welcome back to the show, everyone. Today, I am really excited for my guests because we had asked you listeners and followers, what do you want to learn about more? Like, what are we missing? And so many of you, like literally almost every person wrote in menopause and perimenopause. We want to know more about that. And so I told my team, okay, I know the best expert in this. See if you can get Dr. Haver to come on and talk about this because I love following you on Instagram and learning from you. And so I know my um, listeners today are going to be so pleased with everything they learn. And so thank you so much for being on the show, Dr. Haver, and thank you so much for being here. Oh, you're so welcome. I'm happy to teach as much as I can. Well, I'm excited. I have a lot of questions for you that my listeners had written in. And so we'll try to answer as many as we can. But before we begin, begin, will you just tell my listeners a little bit about yourself, your background, and uh, maybe why you became the menopause specialist? (laughs) So uh, my name is uh, Mary Claire Haver, and I am a medical doctor. I have a, my residency was in obstetrics and gynecology and for about 20 years, I was your very busy, well-trained academic OBGYN physician. So I worked at a large university. I had a huge private practice. I was also teaching medical students and residents and um, happily delivering babies and doing surgeries and doing all the normal things and realized that I had a tremendous gap in my knowledge base when I started going through perimenopause and menopause. And, you know, I was aging with my patients and, you know, we had kind of had babies together, brought up our children together. I have, I worked in a place that is a small town with a huge university, you know, so I was taking care of the PhDs and the MDs and, you know, the people who's the moms at the kids school. And I remember like looking up at the Christmas pageant for the little school play and I delivered half the babies, <laughs> you know, who were uh, delivered baby Jesus and Mary and the three wise men, you know, oh, and funny. so, and I was really happy doing that, but I, I realized that I was not prepared for my own menopause and I had not been doing a good job. I was a terrible menopause provider. And Mm -hmm. so that kind of inspired me to, you know, why is this happening? I was training residents on how to do women's health care, but why was there such a gap in the education and knowledge of the people in charge of taking care of women's health who really weren't trained into all the nuances and what's available and what's really happening to our bodies? And so that's what inspired me to just flip the switch and say, you know what, there's plenty of people to do what I was doing, delivering babies and all of these important things in women's health. But I really want to focus on this because that's where I see my greatest impact and the need is. Oh, I love that. So that's how you got started, teaching everybody mm-hmm. about menopause. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, I want to start at the basics with you because sure. um, some of the questions were simply like, what is perimenopause and menopause? Mm-hmm. What's the difference? They want to know, like, how do I know if I'm in perimenopause? I mean, so many questions. So let's just start at the basics. What is perimenopause okay. and menopause? All right. So to really explain the, the what this is, we have to go way back to when we were embryos. So when you were growing inside of the uterus of your mother, you know, if, if your listeners are female, at about five months gestation, you developed, you know, you develop the maximum amount of eggs you were going to have in your entire life. And so our peak egg count, like, which is our, what we call germ cells in medicine, which is all of our genetic material was formed at five months in utero, you know, by five months in utero. And then when we're born, we have about one to 2 million eggs in our ovaries. And like brain cells, we don't create new ones. We are stuck with the eggs we're going to have for the rest of our lives until they, until we exhaust them. Okay. Okay. That's what a lot of people don't understand. Males, on the other hand, if you have a Y chromosome, you develop testicles and you make your stuff fresh every day, starting in puberty until basically you die. Okay. And so when we're about 30, we're down to 10% of our egg supply. Oh, wow. And when we're 40, we're down to 3% in general, some more, some less, right? But it's a continuous decline. We lose it because the age of our eggs are getting older and they're not as productive, you know, 
And we also, through the ovulation process, we lose about 11,000 each month trying to ovulate. Oh, so wow. we have this continuous steady state loss over time. Now we can accelerate that loss if you smoke cigarettes, if you have surgery, if you have chemotherapy, radiation, environmental things, you know, we definitely can, and if you have trauma, you know, there's some interesting studies on trauma and the age of menopause. So menopause medically is defined one year after your last menstrual period. What that represents is you are out of eggs. You're okay. done. We've exhausted our egg supply and now we're going to live the rest of our lives without eggs. So through the process of ovulation, which is the body's way to try to propagate the species, right? We were born to do this. We're the, we, are, we have the genetic advantage of being the baby makers and the carriers, right? Right. And so we get to a point where we can no longer do that. So what is perimenopause? So if you think about how we ovulate each month, the hypothalamus is in the brain and the pituitary is right under it in the brain, what we call the brainstem. And the hypothalamus is continuously seeking estrogen levels in our blood. It's got a little monitor in there, like a finger in the blood supply. And it's like, how much estrogen do we have? Where are we? Where are we? And so if it's low, like at the beginning of our cycles, it says, hey, pituitary, tell the ovaries to make more estrogen. And they do that through the process of ovulation. Okay. And so the pituitary spits out uh, hormones called LH and FSH that basically stimulate the cells around each egg to try to ovulate. They start producing estrogen and then they pump water around the egg. Then eventually one of them ruptures, the egg comes out and look, you know, gets picked up by the fallopian tubes in a healthy person. And then the rest of that little cyst where the egg came out becomes the corpus luteum and that's where we make our progesterone. And this happens in a very regular fashion every month from puberty until perimenopause. What happens in perimenopause is that we're starting to reach a critical loss of eggs. So the brain is doing the signaling, hey, our estrogen's low, let's start this process over again. But the ovaries are struggling to get that egg out because we don't have enough, we don't have a lot, and the quality of those eggs is poor, is getting poorer as we age, okay? And so the brain's like, hey, I told you to make estrogen. And the ovaries are like, we're trying. So the pituitary makes more and more LH and FSH. So we have delays in our ovulation. It takes longer to get that egg out. And so, and it takes more and more and more LH and FSH, those, those stimulating hormones to make the egg happen. So we're stretching out the time. So, and when we finally get that egg out, we end up with these massive bumps in estrogen, and then it's followed by these rapid, rapid declines. So what used to look like an EKG every month, right? With our, I'm just using it as an analogy, right. most people see an EKG and you have this very steady state production, you know, LH, FSH, and then estradiol, progesterone, and testosterone looks very, very, very similar each month. In perimenopause, it becomes a zone of hormonal chaos <laughs> because the feedback is breaking. We're still managing in it, but it's getting harder and harder. And so we end up with this very rock and roll roller coaster looking crazy. It's a decline over time, but literally you're having these massive surges and falls. That is perimenopause. And that is when something is not right. So here's what most people don't understand as well. And it took me a long time to really like, oh my God, we have estrogen receptors and you know, sex hormone receptors all over our body, not just the uterus, not just the breasts. We have it in the brain, the heart, the lungs, the kidneys, the bone, the skin, the nerves. And when we start having these rapid swishes and fall, you know, everything gets affected. Mental health can change, memory changes, brain fog, how, and then estrogen is also a really powerful anti-inflammatory hormone. Hmm. And when that taken away, we see massive amounts of inflammation popping up in places we never had it before. Our joints, our skin, our you know general urinary system, et cetera. So our perimenopause journey looks very different from woman to woman because the expression of those estrogen receptors is very is as unique as we are. So perimenopause is the beginning of the chaos before the absolute decline. And postmenopause is the rest of your life. Menopause is one day, one day after your last menstrual period, but you are postmenopausal from that day until you die. So menopause is only one day. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of confusion about, oh, I'm menopausal because you're symptomatic. Let me tell you, 
we have the cliche classic symptoms of menopause, hot flashes, night sweats, you know, but we know now in the new book, the new menopause, we have 74, probably over a hundred when we really, really get down to the nitty gritty symptoms that might be affected by the hormone switches in your body, the hormone changes that are going on. Okay. So I think women use the term menopause wrong because just last week at the gym, some lady said to me, oh my goodness, when I was in menopause, my anxiety increased, my joint pain increased so much. I mean, she went through this whole list of things that happened. She's like, you need to talk more about menopause, but that's not true. That was during maybe her perimenopause. So, so you can be symptomatic from perimenopause till death. Okay. Okay. Your bones are always going to deteriorate. Your general urinary system is always going to deteriorate without treatment. Your, you know, but women, we've only been trained in even physicians to equate menopause with the classic symptoms, the hot flashes, the night sweats, because we can't blame those on anything else. And so those do eventually go away for most women, not all. And in it's average of seven years of hot flashes, okay, <sighs> until basically you downregulate the thermoregulatory receptor. But it's very, it gets fried when for 85% of us, when we lose estrogen. But let me tell you, the, if the loss of estrogen is affecting our other organ systems, our cardiovascular disease, our bones, our muscle health, all of it. So, but because forever we define menopause by hot flashes in the loss of period, that's still pervasive. And that's what I hope the new book does is really open your mind to everything that's affected. Okay. So how does someone know if they're in perimenopause? Because menopause, yeah, that so, makes sense. They know, okay, it's been a year since my cycle, therefore. So perimenopause, there we don't have a good blood test for it. That's the problem. Um, now, the all these urine and saliva tests, I would not waste your money on that. We A one-time blood urine or saliva test is rarely diagnostic. Why? Because we have that zone of chaos. It's not predictable. And it just it's a moment in time when you get a blood test done. So it's not telling you, it's not like a hemoglobin A1C, which is telling you what your blood's work look like for six weeks. We don't have that equivalent. And so we make the diagnosis of perimenopause based on symptoms. Mm. I believe my patients. Okay. I don't automatically dismiss her concerns, her symptoms, her, I can't put my finger on this automatically as, oh, it's in your head. You're just getting older. Get over it. I do a lot of blood work. I'm ruling out autoimmune disease, hypothyroidism, nutritional deficiencies, because a lot of things can overlap. And then it becomes a diagnosis of exclusion. Mm -hmm. And so if your listeners are out there and like, something's not right, I have a menopause sc scoring system, you know, I validated scoring tests on my website. They can go and just answer a few questions about severity of certain symptoms and at least get a clue. And then it gives them resources and how to talk to their doctor and, you know, test to ask for, et cetera. Okay. So actually let's talk about some of these symptoms. What are the main sy symptoms of perimenopause and maybe what are some surprising ones that people might not know? We know 85% of women will have hot flashes. A hundred percent of women will stop their periods. Okay. So those are kind of easy. Um, hot flashes, vasomotor symptoms can be hot flashes, night, night sweats. What we also know from these new menopause companies that are coming up and they're doing massive amounts of research on their patients so they don't automatically dismiss, right? We see the number one is fatigue, mm. sleep disruption, weight gain, especially in the midsection, body composition changes. You know, you've been like living your best life, eating, nothing's changed. 80 something percent of women will have a, a I, no reason to account for it, increase in cholesterol. So um, ones that kind of shocked me that basically I had 10,000 people ask me on social media and I was like, let me go do the research. Frozen shoulder. Oh, vertigo, tinnitus, tinnitus. So ringing in the ears, itchy ears, skin changes, feeling ants crawling on your skin. We've known about bone density, of course, osteoporosis, osteopenia. Um, we've known about the general urinary symptoms, so recurrent UTIs. Um, vaginal dryness, pain with intercourse, all of it. So interesting. Some of them I feel like women don't know because someone the other day told me heart palpitations could be heart palpitations, absolutely. Perimenopause. And I was like, I didn't know that. And I've actually sort of Very been feeling those lately and I was getting worried. And so yeah. I actually went to see wow. a doctor. You should see your doctor. Rule right. out other things. Again, we never want to miss a heart problem, but when all the tests are negative, which for 80 something percent of you, it will be, 
it's probably menopause. This is how your sinoatrial node and the thermoregulatory center in the brain, which controls our hot flashes, also can send signals to the heart. And so some people will feel like they're having a panic attack and palpitations right before their hot flushes, or they won't even have a hot flush. They'll just all of a sudden be standing. Well, one lady, one patient was telling me she you know, was just at the grocery store and all of a sudden she's just checking out, you know, puts loading her groceries on the, on the scanner. And she just was overwhelmed all of a sudden with like palpitations and she started sweating and she got anxious and, you know, she had to be escorted out to her car. And so women are showing up in the ER with chest pain, shortness of breath, you know, and no one is connecting the dots that this is menopause. Okay. Well, that's why I want to ask you because my good friend, um, she was just dealing with so much anxiety all of a sudden in her late forties, early fifties. And so she went to the doctor and they're like, oh yeah, you just need some anti-anxiety medicine. And so she did that and then did her own research and realized, oh my gosh, I'm like, it was right before she hit menopause. And she's like, it was the perimenopause doing like causing the anxiety. So why don't doctors maybe ask like, how old are you? Are you in menopause? Like, you know, this is the, this is the million dollar question. Why are we not training? All, why is it dumped in the lap of the busy ob who's trying to deliver babies and do pap smears and, and whatever? Why aren't we training medical school? Why isn't there a whole section on menopause? Because we are half of the population and 100% of us, if we live long enough, are going to go through this. And it is dramatically affecting our health and right. how we approach the world. And, and we are not little men. Why is when you go to women's health research, 95% of it is in reproduction you know, and, and only 5% or less is in anything to do with menopause. Like, why are we not focusing on this part of our lives? How, why do society view women of a certain age as non-productive human beings? Why are we having such an exodus of women at the top of their game? They back in the workforce, raise their kids that are ready to go. And they're getting blindsided by perimenopause and menopause when they are ready to lead. You know, like there's so many things about, you know, it's misogyny, it's paternalism, it's all the things. And we have got to stand up and say enough. Yeah. Well, I love what what you're doing. I mean, you're opening the eyes to a lot of people and I know doctors are listening. So we need more people like you talking about this. So thank you. But let's actually talk about some of the options that are available to women Mm -hmm. to treat menopause. Because first of all, you were talking about hot flashes and some doctor I interviewed on a podcast said hot flashes have a lot to do with magnesium levels. Women need to up their uh, magnesium. Uh, no, <laughs> no. Sell magnesium. no. <laughs> okay. So magnesium won't help calm those down. Hot flashes are due to dysregulation of the thermoregulatory center in the brain from the lack of estrogen, the end. Okay. okay. You may have a very temporary short term release, but all these poor, you know, we created a vacuum of menopause care, and we've had a lot of me- well meaning healthcare providers in different areas trying to help because they don't understand menopause. Mm-hmm. But, you know, and I believe me, I know this literature better than most. I've read, I just wrote a book, I've read a 2000 studies. Menopause is due to lack of estrogen. And you may have temporary relief here and there. And, but, there's nothing that's going to bring your estrogen levels back without transplanting a 25 year old ovary back in your body. Now, a lot of research is happening around how to extend the shelf life of the ovary. We're still in clinical trial, you know, like, like that's coming, but we're a generation away, I think from that being reality. Okay. So let's talk about some other options available to women then. So hormone replacement therapy, I hear so much about this. So let's talk about it because you hear it's amazing. And then you've got others that are like, and don't really do it. And then you've got some saying every single woman should be on it. Uh, Not every woman should be on it. Every woman should deserves the conversation as to the risks benefits for her. And that's the conversation that's not happening. Okay. Okay. They're walking in and they're getting dismissed. People are saying, I don't believe in it. You know, and so then they scurry home, you know, they're crying and, oh my God, how am I going to survive? You know, any conversation about women's health from 35 and on should always include a conversation about the management of her menopause. 
we have such an opportunity. I don't look at hormone therapy as medicine, and that is not the only thing I talk to my patients about. Lifestyle is critical to maintain our health. Okay. And I'm going to ask you about that in a minute, but we'll yeah. stay with Hormone me. therapy is one little tool in your toolbox. Okay. But you can't ignore nutrition. You can't ignore movement and all those things. And we'll get to that, but let's talk about hormones. So every woman deserves a conversation a hundred percent. And for her to make a critical decision as to if she wants to adopt this as part of her healthcare, I look at it as thyroid replacement for women who have hypothyroidism. We are allowing your body to continue critical metabolic pathways, critical enzymatic processes that are going to lead to you having better health. Can you live without hormone replacement therapy? Yes. Can you be healthy without hormone replacement therapy? Of course, but it's harder. Okay. And I'm trying to stack all the cards in my favor to keep me out of a nursing home for as long as possible. You know, I do not want to burden my children with my long-term illness if I can. And right. hormone therapy for many women is going to be a critical part of maintaining her health. Okay. So what is hormone replacement therapy exactly? Yeah. So when we look at the sex hormones that our body makes, we have the ovary makes estradiol. It makes several smaller estrogens, but you know. So when we talk about replacement, pretty much it's estradiol. There is estrone, which is created in our fat cells. It is a much let, it becomes the dominant estrogen without replacement in menopause because that's the only, the ovary is shut down. We can't make it. Estrone is created in the fat cells. It's not as nearly as biologically active, which is why we suffer so much in postmenopause. And it's very pro-inflammatory, which is why people worry about it with breast cancer and other malignancies. And so, but there are docs out there in the alternative space who were recommending estrone, like in mm. the triads. I'm like, I, I wouldn't do that. Um, there's estriol, which is the hormone that the placenta creates when, if anyone's ever pregnant, that is the dominant estrogen um, in created by the placenta. That's used in biased. I, again, nothing I would ever recommend. I'm just trying to restore over, you know, give you back what your ovaries used to make. There's progesterone. That's what's made in the second half of our cycle. And there's also testosterone. Now, testosterone is a little bit different. We have other ways to create testosterone. The adrenal pathway creates about half the 50%. So when we go through menopause, we lose 99% of estradiol in our body. We're down to less than 1%. Wow. We lose 99% of our progesterone production in our bodies, less than 1%. And we lose about 50% or, or more of testosterone wow. in our bodies. So when we talk about replacement, we're talking about estrogens, progestogens, and androgens, which includes testosterone. Okay. So when people are on hormone replacement therapy, are they replacing all three of those or are they just doing estrogen? It depends. So we have great, 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 great studies around estrogen. Um, we have to get progesterone if you have, so if you get estrogen, you have to have progesterone if you have, still have a uterus to protect the lining of the inside lining, the endometrium from developing hyperplasia or malignancy from unopposed estrogen. However, it turns out progesterone has some other benefits. So besides protection, it's really helpful for sleep. It's really helpful for anxiety in a lot of patients. So it's optional if you don't have a uterus or if you have an IUD. Um, but if you, but I'm, quite often I'm giving it for those patients to help with sleep and other things. Testosterone is, we do not have an FDA approved option. I was never trained on testosterone replacement in women. This is something I've learned in the last five years. Wow. And so a lot of doctors are scared of it. Uh, you know, they're, they're scared enough of HRT because of all the overblown, mm -hmm. redacted, you know, study, that one, one study that changed the face of medicine forever for women. Um, not forever. We're fighting to, you know, bring it back to the light, but, um, you know, there, and then, oh my God, testosterone, how do you prescribe it? It's not easy. So it depends on the doctor and what clinic you go to. Okay. So with the estrogen and progesterone, do they need to be bioavailable or synthetic is okay? What are your thoughts on that? So the studies, it, you know, synthetic means different things to different people. So body bioidentical simply means estradiol oh, and okay. progesterone. Okay. We have synthetic versions of both. 
You don't have to get compounded in order to get body identical. I am on an estradiol patch that I pick up from Walgreens. So actually now Express Scripts strips it to my house. It's easier and cheaper. So um, it is FDA approved. It is regular, you know, and it is 100% body identical. So that's that. Um, most of the estrogens now, if you get estradiol and progesterone, they are plant derived. So they come from, most of them come from yams or one of the subspecies, but you don't just roll yourself in a bucket of yams and you get hormone therapy. The yam cream does not work. Save your money. Sorry. You know, I wish it did. The progesterone molecule is huge and does not absorb well through the skin. So if any of you are on progesterone cream and you're on an estrogen, you are not, your uterus is not considered protected. You need to find mm. a new doctor and get on oral micronized progesterone. So um, testosterone, we don't have an FDA approved option. It is body identical. You never want to take that orally. It's it's hepatotoxic, okay? That, mm. So, you know, if your doctor is trying to give you, unless it's undecanoate, which is hard to find in the US, they have it in Europe. Um, you know, really you, your, your provider is probably trying to do something nice, but doesn't understand the science and the risks. And so you need a transdermal option for um, testosterone for safety. Okay. So good to know all of this because I do know a lot of women on progesterone creams. And yeah. so you're yeah. not for that at all. Um, they're not safe. So especially if you're, if you're just on a progesterone cream by itself without estrogen, it's not going to hurt you. Okay? okay. But it's probably not very effective. And, um, I would, you know, that is not anything in my space, the dot, you know, the menopause, we would never prescribe a, a progesterone cream. Um, now there are like combi patch and the Climera pro, they have synthetic, synthetic progestins that work well, that are in those patches that are transdermal. They've been micronized to pass through the skin. And so, um, so those are okay. You know, when we look at risk factors, Formulation does seem to matter. It looks like the safety, I mean, not the safety, the benefits, whether it's synthetic or not, are pretty much there as far as your hot flashes will go away, your bones will get stronger, you know, the things that they're measuring now, um, whether it's synthetic or body identical. Where we're really digging into the data is the safety profile, risks of blood clots, risk of breast cancer, et cetera. And that does look like formulation matters. And guess what? The studies are kind of, you know, non-conclusive, but it does seem to edge towards body identical versions being a little bit safer. The best choice. Okay. So I know a lot of women don't like to go on hormone replacement therapy because they are afraid of breast cancer. It contributes right. to that. Is that really a true risk or is this more of a so, myth? So it's mostly a myth. So if we look at estrogen, even in the WHI, the women who were on estrogen only, so they had a hysterectomy. So the women in that arm versus placebo had a 30% decreased risk of breast cancer. Wow. Estrogen is not carcinogenic. Okay. It does not cause genetic mutations within the cell. That's carcinogenesis means, right? Right. It feeds a breast cancer and it keeps a breast cell healthy so that it can keep the more you divide, the more chance you have of mutation. And if you're born with a genetic predisposition where either you have a, a cancer promotion gene or your, your cancer fighting genes are blocked, those are kind of the two families of why people have these familial cancers, then, you know, and, and to get to a breast cancer cell or any cancer cell, you take a healthy cell, you let it divide, and eventually a mutation will hit. Do you know that we get cancer every day? in different areas of our body and our immune systems just swoop in and fight it immediately. It's recognized as foreign boom. Right. And so, you know, our highest levels of estrogen in our bodies ever are when we're pregnant. If you've, if you've ever been pregnant, women don't tend to get breast cancer in pregnancy. So just think about it. So in any discussion around breast cancer, the fear of breast cancer is driving the healthcare decisions for most women in menopause. And it's ridiculous. Women die of heart disease. Women break their hips. When we're talking about risk benefit ratio, I am talking about the protective effects of estrogen in your body, which are well established. Right. Estrogen protects. And when you're talking about risks of breast cancer and you're not talking about her bones, her brain, her mental health, and all the other things, you are doing a disservice to women. I love it. I love your passion for it. And that's why you're changing the world because of your passion for it. Um, okay. So thank you for answering those questions about hormone replacement therapy. 
But now let's talk about, because you said it's only one tool out of the whole toolbox to mm -hmm. help you through the perimenopause, menopause time. What are some of those other tools? I know you talked about nutrition. So let's talk about that. I ha where I kind of got started in this whole path was my frustration with unexplained weight gain. Well, it was a little bit explained. I was grieving for my brother's death, but unexplained, I can't get this weight off no matter what I do. That's where and I'm at right now. So let's talk about this. This is something my patients had gone through for years. You know, I kind of had poo pooed it and pat them on the knee and forgive me if you're listening, because you, you know, I'm sorry. Um, I was taught calories in, calories out. That's all I was taught. And if someone had a weight problem, it's because they were lazy. They were, you know, modern obesity research has dispelled all of this. Okay. Right. I was not obese. Let me be clear. I had about a 15, 20 pound weight gain that was just cosmetically driving me crazy. Okay. Um, I didn't understand body composition. I didn't understand muscle mass. Like I was only healthy meant thin. Okay. And that is a disservice to women. Right. And that relentless pursuit of thinness in the guise of health is ridiculous. And we need to get away from that language. But um, when I talk to my patients, I'm able to do a body scan. I have a body scanner in my office, that electrical impedance scanner from InBody, and I'm able to oh, measure okay. her muscle mass mm -hmm. and her fat and her visceral fat. Subcutaneous fat is the fat under our skin. It gives us curves. It gives us cellulite. We don't like it. It's cosmetically distressing, but unless you have huge amounts, it's not that dangerous. Okay. okay. Visceral fat is the internal abdominal fat, that the new fat that starts in perimenopause. So women tend to gain weight with age, but we see a massive acceleration in visceral fat deposition. So we go from about 8% visceral fat to up to 30% visceral fat just through the menopause transition. What does that look like? Your abdomen expands. All of a sudden your waist is thicker and you're like, I haven't done anything different. So you yep. eat a little less, work out a little more and it gets a little better. Then it comes right back. And, you know, we end up in these yo-yo cycling when a lot of us were kind of happy and doing well, you know, or just, just everything that changes. That visceral fat is pro-inflammatory. So when we look at nutrition, I say, look, if I locked you in a cave and starved you, you would lose visceral fat, but you'd always, you would also lose muscle mass. Guess what else is happening in menopause, in perimenopause? The rate at which we're losing muscle mass begins to accelerate. It doesn't have to, but if you kind of keep the status quo, the habits that kept you healthy in your 30s and early 40s, stop working. And so- <laughs> Here's what I tell my patients. The average U.S. woman on the Western diet is eating about 12 grams of fiber per day. Fiber is nothing we ever tracked before, you mm -hmm. know? And you need minimum 25. That's going to feed your gut microbiome. That's going to keep stool moving quickly. That's going to slow down the absorption of sugars from your bloodstream into the blood. You know, it's going to level out your insulin levels and it will stop this drive to the viscera. So when women do that, they have less visceral fat, added sugars. So, you know, we've demonized sugars, partly good, partly bad through the keto movement. A lot of people just stopped eating fruits and stuff. Turns out when you really look at how this affects our blood sugar, our blood supply, added sugars are the culprit. The sugars added in cooking and processing, not fruits and vegetables. Yep. So limiting those added sugars to 25 grams per day does a huge amount you know, the drinks, the condiments, the where they're sneaking sugars into processed foods. And so my patients are shocked when they're like, oh my God, I'm reading the labels. And I could not believe how much added sugars I was getting in my diet per day when I really thought I was eating healthy. Yep. And so um, the third is, you know, movement. So I, you know, I was a cardio queen. I did marathons and aerobics and all the things. And, you know, cardio is important, but my generation is scared of weights. Yeah. And don't know how to lift and don't understand the importance of maintaining our muscle mass. Muscle mass is what determines your basal metabolic rate. That's how many calories you burn at rest. So calories are important, but just the mindless drive to calorically count without paying attention to nutrition is doing us a disservice. Yeah. And so eating adequate protein, most women are not. They eat a tiny bit with breakfast, a little more with lunch, and then they blow it out on their dinner. You need to stretch that protein out throughout the day. And really the FDA recommends 0.8. It needs to be double that. So for most women, it's somewhere between 90 to 120 
grams per day, just depending. I mean, I had a six foot tall, you know, 180 pound healthy woman come in the other day. She needs a lot of protein. Yeah. <laughs> so to maintain yeah. that muscle mass. Yeah. Um, so if she's sarcopenic, meaning she's got really low muscle mass, I'm going on the high end, you know, so it just, it really depends, but it's a lot more than I used to recommend. Women who do that in that WHI study had much less frailty scores. So get thin out of your head is what I tell my patients. And let's focus on strong. We need to be lifting. We need to be eating adequate protein. All of that is going to stop driving fat to the viscera. And this is a marathon, not a sprint. If you're looking for quick weight loss, I'm not the doctor for you to follow. You know, we have, if she's obese and has dealt with obesity for a lifetime, we have a conversation around the GLP-1 agonists. They're not for everyone. The side effects can be rough, but it can be another important tool in the toolkit, especially in the you know morbidly obese patient who sees the road ahead of her as far as her health risks. And so again, I don't think it's for everyone, but I just wanted to throw that out there. We talk about, you know, strength training, have they started it? We, I'm a big fan of the weighted vest. So mm -hmm. it's a quick and easy like cheat for um, you. You can wear it doing housework. You can wear it. I wear it when I'm not doing Zoom calls. I have it. <laughs> it's right over there. I wear it that's around awesome. the house. I wear it on my treadmill. I work with it on. So that's a really easy way. And it's also great for osteoporosis prevention as well. Okay. So I have a couple questions about what you've just said, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. So first sure. of all, with protein, um, I did a post the other day that said 0.8 per pound of That's um, the FDA recommendation. It's not enough. When you look at Stacey Sims, when you look at Gabrielle Lyon, you know, when you look at the docs who are looking at women's health and how much protein we need to stay healthy, fit, and active into our 60s and 70s, it's way higher than okay. that. I am going to shout this from the rooftops then because in that post, all these comments were like, that is way too much. I all my calorie, I'd like go way over on my calories if I was eating that much protein. This is absurd. And so that's, I love that you're saying, no, it's more than that for women in perimenopause and menopause. Yeah. Okay. So, so then weightlifting, um, I've had people say to me, well, I'm like 53 and I've never lifted weights. Like, do I just start lifting? And the answer is yes. Right. Yes. I would get some help. Um, there's YouTube videos, you know, this is where a personal trainer can really help at least to get you started. We don't want to get injured, right? So we're all like, okay, I need to lift weights, but no one knows how. Um, you need to do, so if you're on the couch, just start walking. And then once you're comfortable walking regularly, pick up some weights, put on a weighted vest to do it. You know, then, you know, we have to meet our patients and our followers where they are. But uh, most people do walk or, or try to do some cardio, but really don't understand the basic biomechanics of safely lifting weights. I did not. So I've worked with trainers. I've got one right now. She's all inspired and started a menopause boot camp. You know, there's YouTube videos. It's just learning to do it safely and shooting for progressive load. If you're working out with the same eight pound dumbbells that you've had your whole life and you're not trying to get stronger, you're not really maximizing what you could do here. Okay. And so when you talk about lifting weights, are you talking a certain amount each week? Like it needs to be four days, five days, six days. What are your thoughts? I tell my patients, you know, 150 minutes a week of cardio, likely in zone two with a few sprints thrown in, seems to be a pretty good mix for most women in our stage. Um, and then, so that's a brisk walk. You know, I stopped running, wasn't doing my knees any, you know, I can walk for 27 miles, you know, like, right. and with my girlfriends and we're chatting and I've got my weighted vest and, you know, it's my community, but lifting at least two days a week, you need a push day, a pull day, you know, you need to do core balance, make sure you're doing things on one leg, you know, maintaining our balance and our flexibility is also important as we age. And so, you know, it depends on Pilates, yoga, listen, whatever works, but you need to be getting stronger through the process. And it is possible for women in their late 40s, 50s to gain 50s, muscle, 70s, correct? 80s to gain muscle and they've proven it. Yeah. Okay. And so we just don't know how, and they weren't focused on that, but you know, there's great studies of, you know, octogenarian females in nursing homes and they threw weighted vests on them and they saw improvements in bone density. They saw them being able to lift. They were doing progressive load with, they're doing squats and, and deadlifts and it's incredible. Yeah. The other day at the gym, I saw a 62 year old benching like double what I bench. And I was like, wow, goals. I love that. So 
we've talked about the cardio, the muscle or the weightlifting, the diet, but let me ask you in the diet. So you say at least 25 grams of fiber. Is that what you I think? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I know people will say to me after hearing this, they'll be like, I try, but I can't eat that many fruits and veggies or something. Can I do a fiber supplement? Do you like a fiber supplement or no? So yeah, I actually, I sell a few supplements and one of them is fiber, you know, full disclosure. So I'm like, look, if you can get 25 to 35 a day in your nutrition, great. But, and I'm able to hit 25 consistently, no problem. But on the days where I'm struggling to get to 35, I will supplement fiber. It's not as great as food. Um, you want a fiber supplement that has soluble and insoluble fiber. They both have important jobs. Mine has a mixture of different sources so that, you know, we try to mix it up. Um, but still, if you can do nothing, psyllium husk has some great studies. It's not very expensive. It kind of tastes like sawdust, but you can get through that. Just watch for additives and sugars that are sometimes added for taste. You don't need all that stuff. Okay. And are there certain supplements that women in this age group should be really concerned yeah. about? Things that might so help? So 80% of my patients have a vitamin D deficiency when they hit the door. And mm -hmm. it's really hard because of our gut microbiome changing and the way we process in the gut of the absorption. And we're protecting rightfully so our skin from sun damage. And so, um, myself included, I've, I've got a supplement vitamin D. It's hard to get it through enough through food to stay healthy. And so the vitamin D we create has K for increased bioavailability and vitamin K. And then it also has omega-3 fatty acids. It was just an easy thing for me to sneak in there to, you know, and omega-3s are found in lots of things, but they're really the highest quality is going to be in fatty fish. So especially patients who are vegan or vegetarian, a vitamin D supplement is often going to serve them well. Anything else besides the vitamin so, D that's important? So for my patients, you know, I started using a very specific collagen um, for skin um, years and years and years ago. And so I've created a new product that has that particular bioactive collagen with something called Fortibone. It's in, in our company, we call it Skin and Bone. The Fortibone has been studied in osteopenic and osteoporotic women. It was a small study, but very, very significant gains in, in bone density. Mm -hmm. They measured over five years their uh, bone density scans. And look, I'm just trying to stack the cards in my favor. Women, 50% of women will have an osteoporotic fracture. Wow. This is preventable. Okay. And if it, you fall and break your hip, you have a 30% chance of death in one year. And that after 65, and that is with surgery. Wow. Without surgery, it's almost 80%. And so, and that year is marked with massive decline, you know, right. and, and your, your listeners are going to be shit. Yep. My aunt, my mom, whatever. Yep. That, this is preventable strength training, protein intake, these collagens, you know, HRT, all of this can work together to keep our bones strong. Okay. So good to know. So we've talked about the diet, the weightlifting, all that sleep. I know sleep plays an overall, um, huge part in our health, but a lot of people in perimenopause struggle with sleep. So what do you suggest? So about 85% of patients will have incredible sleep disruptions through perimenopause and menopause. And this is directly, you know, due to mental health changes, which are causing more anxiety and, and racing thoughts, um, as well as just complete disruption of sleep from hot, from the vasomotor symptoms. And so hormone therapy is huge here. Okay. That being said, I am on hormone therapy. I cannot drink alcohol mm -hmm. <laughs> the way I used to be able to. And so, so many of my patients, my followers, not all, but most, are seeing that they can't process alcohol the same way. And I just say, hey, listen, if you're choosing to drink, you might be choosing not to sleep. And so limiting alcohol intake, especially six hours before sleep can go huge. You know, limiting all stimulants, of course, sleep hygiene, that is so important. What we don't want is long-term sleep aid medications. We are seeing terrible results with Benadryl taken every night with dementia. We're seeing um, now you know, occasional use of a sleep aid is fine. We all get into situations, we go overseas, we have a death of a level, whatever it is. Right. But like every night having to take something, a benzodiazepine or a sedative is not going to do you well long-term. Long-term melatonin is not recommended either. So, you know, we need to figure out what is going to help you sleep. And sometimes it takes a sleep medicine specialist. Another thing women don't realize, we don't snore as much as men do 
with our obstructive sleep apnea. Hmm. OSA goes undiagnosed in women tremendously. If you have done all the things, you're on HRT and you're still not sleeping, go get a sleep study. Go do it. Insurance will cover it. You need to be evaluated for obstructive sleep apnea because you don't present like a man. And someone's not going to think about that. I could save a life right now. So that's good advice. Okay. So as we wrap up here, I know women are saying, are going to think, okay, I need to go see my doctor. I've got these different signs that she's talked about, but I know they're going to go to doctors and the doctors are going to dismiss things. I wish you could just bust into your internist, your OBGYN, your family medicine doctor and be like, Hey, turns out 80% of them won't even talk to you about menopause. You know, we've done the studies, only 6% of residents last year and those three specialties coming out felt comfortable dealing with menopause. And this is not making them bad people. This is bad education. So where do we go? We're a generation away from fixing that. So what do you do? The Menopause Society here in the U.S. has, it's menopause.org, has a list of go to their certified providers, the ones who took the test, okay? They have a list of everybody who's a member. Look for the certified check. That's what, call ahead though. Doesn't mean that they're perfect. Make sure, you know, call ahead and say, will this clinician have a conversation with me about menopause and my treatment options? You know, know that on the front end. On my website, I have a list of testimonials from my followers who were gracious enough to give us information about clinicians they felt did a wonderful job. You can go check that out. There are some wonderful telemedicine companies, and they don't pay me to say this, who have popped up. Midi, Alloy Health, and Evernow are the three I've vetted. I've looked at others, don't love them, so I'm not going to say their names. But those three, I would send my sister to. So good to know. Are there certain questions, though, that people should be prepared to ask them? Or are, do they just say, hey, these are my symptoms. Could it be perimenopause? I think you need to be prepared, especially if the provider is not menopause certified. So I, you know, on my website, I have the menopause empowerment guide, and we have a full list of questions for your doctor um, and lab tests to discuss. Okay. Um, that might be helpful for you. And so... Um, Everything, you know, being very clear about what your symptoms are, not to try to do this during your well woman exam. That's not what the well woman exam is about. You need a separate problem visit, a menopause visit. You know, what I talk about going first morning appointment, your doctor's fresh. <laughs> they haven't been called out to go deliver babies and do all these things. And so I have all these tips on try to how to get the most out of these exams. Oh, I love that. Okay. Everybody refer to her website because I know so many of you will have questions. Um, I'm really excited for your new book that's coming out. Will you just tell my listeners a little bit about it, when it will be out, where they can find it, things like that? Sure. So it's called The New Menopause, and it is going to be released April 30th. It is available for pre-order everywhere you buy books now. Um, we have a pre-order bonus on our website. Uh, you get the first chapter for free. I wanted to start leaking out the information as soon as I could, but it really is what to expect when you're never going to expect again. I want this to be a, a Bible for women, for women going through it, women about to go through it and those who love them so that they are prepared and everybody's kind of on board to understand, you know, it, we do a big explanation on all the biomechanics of menopause, every organ system it affects, as well as a symptom guide, and then how you can address each symptom with nutrition, with exercise, with supplements, you know, what we know works in these things, everything from brain fog, mental health changes, et cetera, as well as pharmacologic options, hormone therapy, and non-hormonal options as well. Oh, I love this. I'm going to have to get that because as soon as you said brain fog, I was like, ah, we didn't even talk about brain fog being one of the symptoms, but that's a huge Mm -hmm. one. And so you- you give advice in your book of how to maybe help that. That's what it yes. sounds like. Okay. Awesome. Well, as we wrap up here, what little last advice do you want to share with those that are maybe dealing with this perimenopause, menopause? What last advice can you give them? You know, menopause is inevitable, but you suffering through it is not. And it's going to take a little hustle on your part, educating yourself, finding the right provider, but you deserve a conversation about how you're going to maintain your best health in menopause and a provider who's going to partner with you on that. And I would say, don't be ashamed. Some I've heard no. women say like, oh, I'm embarrassed to go in or I feel ashamed or, and I'm like, no, don't be embarrassed or any of that. Go, 
you know, yeah. empower yourself like, with this knowledge. Proud 55 year old menopausal woman. I've never looked better. I've never felt better. You know, it, I've had to change my habits, change the way I think about the world, but I am my most productive. I've reached, I've helped more women than I've ever helped in my career. And I don't know if I would be able to do that without all the changes I've had to make to my life. Oh, I love that you've made these changes and now are helping others um, because of those changes. Will you um, just tell my listeners really quickly where they can find you and learn more from you? So I'm on just about every social media channel at Dr. Mary Claire, Mary Claire Haver. Um, and our website is thepauselife.com. Okay, good to know. And listeners, she is so amazing to follow. Like I said, at the very beginning of the show, you will learn so much by following her. So go follow her. And then Dr. Haver, I always close my podcast by asking my guests what they have found to be the best ingredient in life. What would you say it is? Education. I love that because I feel, especially as women, we need to empower ourselves. And that comes through educating ourselves and knowing what's out there, knowing our options and our choices. Yeah, agree completely. Well, thank you for all the educating that you do and sharing with others. Um, we, we all appreciate it. And thank you so much. I know you're super busy. So thank you for taking the time to be on this podcast today. You're welcome. <laughs> 